Hello again. Uh, several weeks ago, uh, my wife Robert and I went out to dinner at a Mexican food restaurant. We sat outside, naturally. Uh, when the check came, uh, I paid for the, the food, and I noticed that my change was short at about 63 cents. So I thought, well, the server probably made a mistake. It's not a big deal. Let's just move on, and we left. A few weeks later, though, on a Sunday morning, a funny thing happened to me on the way to church. I stopped at a Ralph's Market to buy some water, and when the clerk rang up the purchase, it totaled $9.07. I gave her a $10 bill, and she says, uh, we don't do change. I said, we don't do change? Uh, what does that mean? Uh, I was totally disoriented. Now, that's not the way it works. Uh, I wanted to say, well, I do change, but I didn't. So what happened then with my 93 cents, I asked her. And she said, well, we put it back on your Ralph's card. I again was disoriented. What's going on with all this? So when I got home, I did some research. And I found out that really this idea of retaining the change is just another result of the crisis of the, the COVID virus. The responsibility goes squarely on it for the nation's shortage of quarters, dimes, nickels, and pennies. The economy shut down because of the crisis to try and stop the virus, and that had an unintended consequence to it. All the flow of coins, nickels, dimes, whatever it may be, throughout all the households and through businesses and through banks had slowed down significantly. So i got to tell you, for the past several months, I've felt a bit disoriented and in many ways because of all of the, the change. Prior to the pandemic, I felt well, pretty oriented with the customs and practices and routines of life. But all of this, the changes week to week, month to month, I still feel a little bit disoriented. So it was as if I was on a wilderness journey where at each turn I had to stop and reorient myself. All of this to say that I've learned through these experiences uh, and many more like them, well, I guess I don't do change either, pun intended, at least not uh, the way I should. So this morning what I want to do is invite you to go on a wilderness of another kind with me as we fly over Israel's history uh, with just a few verses. So first let's look at Israel's original orientation as God's people. God chose the family of Abraham. Well, that's pretty clear in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. And God tells Abraham that he will make him into an entire nation, a nation that will prosper, a nation that will grow, a nation that will have a great reputation, a nation that will be secure. And then there was the disorientation as a result of change, spelled out in Exodus chapters 12, 1 through 12. So for 430 years, the people of Israel lived in Egypt in a type of quarantine, you might say, as slaves, before God liberated them. And finally, there was a reorientation that takes place in Israel's life. After God rescued his people from Egypt, he led them to Mount Sinai. And at Mount Sinai, he established a covenant partnership with them. And God affirms that covenant of them being his chosen people in Exodus chapter 19, verse 5, where we read, Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations you will be my treasured possession. I kind of wonder what Abraham was thinking about all this change. Well, when we, we uh, recall uh, Israel's ancient uh, journey and the many different changes that they encountered in our own past seven months of change, for that matter, any type, we might feel, well, maybe our own sense of moving from orientation, that which we know and are familiar with, through the disorientation, change that we encounter in life, and a back to reorientation of familiarity with our life and customs. All this 
can stir up a whole lot of emotions in our heart, uh, even a reluctance to change and maybe an unhealthy rebellion to change. In her book, uh, A Beautiful Disaster, author Marlena Graves, referring to both Israel's uh, liberty uh, from Egypt and their wandering, and ours today. And she writes, He brought us out to save us, to show us His power, to offer His comfort, and to put to death whatever is in us that is not of Him. You know, being finite creatures, it's difficult for us to understand how God's providence and His goodness interacts with this present evil age. But one thing we do know for sure, that God's economy never shuts down. It's not in short supply, and in fact, he wastes no experiences of ours. In seven months, this trial is like other trials that we've had in our life, really. It's no different. God makes use of the experiences to transform us and to lead us ultimately to be closer to him. Most of you... um, probably know all the lyrics to the the worship song by Chris Tomlin, You're a Good, Good Father. Well, I don't, so I looked them up, and boy, this is beautiful. Listen to the way it reads. I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard a tender whisper of love in the dead of night. And you tell me that you're pleased, and that I'm never alone. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. And I've seen many searching for answers far and wide, but I know we're all searching for answers only you provide because you know just what we need. Before we say a word, you're a good, good father because you were perfect in all of your ways, and so on. Now, that doesn't sound like a father that would abandon his children to change in a wilderness trial. Any disorienting trial of it involves change. And change will either draw us deeper into a relationship with a good, good father, or will cause us to turn our backs in favor of our own familiar control. It's hard to cope with change, I know, because we are creatures and we're finite and we have habits. And it is difficult to orient and reorient life. And I've heard it said that there really are two different types of tent that you can uh, camp in while you're exposed in a wilderness of change. Either you will camp in the tent of discontentment or contentment. I suspect there's a lot more wilderness to come, those experiences. So we got to make sure that we choose the right tent to camp in. Well, if we understand that God is in all authority, he's sovereign over all things that happen, then we can completely trust him. And we can fix our eyes on Jesus. And we can see that every trial, every change is a blessing, no matter what type. So first we need to make sure, number one, that we are oriented in Christ. Meaning that we have a relationship with God through Jesus' death on the cross for our sins and in our place. And second, we need to make sure that things are that are disorienting we filter through what jesus has to say listening to his word and then living in accordance with that word and then finally we need to embrace the change for what god will do in the midst of it to our benefit our blessing and his glory hope to see you again soon here